Tony DeWitt here, Missouri appellate attorney, retired. None of what follows is legal advice. I'm here to do some video for you today to talk about an interesting subject on the law, and here it is. Every now and then, I find a case that comes up through my regular searches that uh, just really kind of hits me in the gut. I recognize that I'm having an emotional reaction to a legal case, and so I kind of put it aside and let it vegetate for a little bit and decide whether or not it's something I want to talk about. In this particular case, there are not a lot of really important legal issues, uh, but there are important underlying issues that I think need to be discussed. And so... I'm going to tell you today about this case from the state of Mississippi. This case is R.W. and J.R., and of course they're using initials here so that they don't, I guess, damage the reputation of both the children and the parents of these children. This They're going up against the Missouri, I'm sorry, the Mississippi Department of Child Protection Services. And so, how did, we, how did we get there? Well, R.W. and J.R. are the biological parents of Rachel and, Ro and Joshua. And R.W. gave birth to the twins prematurely on May 9th of 2022. So they're now more than two years old. That same day, R.W. and the twins tested positive for amphetamines. So in the hospital world, they test children for a lot of different things when they're born. They draw blood, and the reason they do that is because every now and again you come across somebody who, for whatever reason, has abused substances and has placed their child at risk. Now, in this case, as we're going to learn here in a little bit, this wasn't her first rodeo. These were her seventh and eighth children, and she didn't have custody of any of them because she had a massive drug abuse problem. So the Jackson County Youth Court immediately placed the children in the custody of the Department of Child Protective Services, and then they filed a an action essentially to strip the, the parents of their parental rights. And that's a pretty serious thing when you come in and say, we are taking your children because you are essentially uh, unworthy of them because you have neglected them, and in this case, you've abused and neglected them by exposing them to toxic substances. And so what happened was they held a disposition hearing, and the Child Protective Services was allowed to bypass reasonable efforts to reunify the twins with their parents. So under Mississippi law, whenever a child is taken away from their parents, the goal is at some point to get them back together with their parents. That is a laudable public policy goal because, you know, you want to encourage people to take care of their own children. But the problem comes in when you have an individual who just can't be rehabilitated. And as a result, you place the child back with them and they go right back to whatever they were doing, whether it's drinking, whether it's drugs, whether it's hitting the children. Whatever the bad behavior was that got the Child Protective Services people involved in the first place continues. Now, they don't just give up on you after two strikes and you're out. A lot of places, particularly in Missouri, will work with you for a long time sometimes well past the points of prudence. I, I think very much that once you have failed twice, that's when the presumption ought to be that these people love drugs more than they love their kids, and you take them away and you terminate their parental rights. But that is not necessarily what the states in these cases usually do. They're, these offices are staffed by social workers, and social workers by training tend to be very compassionate, considerate people, sometimes so compassionate that they forget to be compassionate of the children. But in this case, uh, as we'll see, they had good reason to suspect that this woman was not going to make it to mother of the year. So R.W. and J.R. raised four issues on appeal. They 
They urge a lack of subject matter jurisdiction and personal jurisdiction. They argue that the venue was improper, that there was insufficient evidence to support an adjudication of neglect, and that there was insufficient evidence to support the youth court's finding that to bypass reasonable efforts to reunite the children with their parents. And I think the Mississippi Supreme Court says it all when they say that next line there, finding no error, we affirm the youth court's judgment. So they gave birth to these twins. She gave birth to these twins on May 9th, 2022. Now, R.W. is the mom. J.R. was named the putative father. And B.W. was named the legal father. And that's because under the law, in Mississippi at the time, R.W. and B.W. were married, and even though she had had this child with another man, he became the legal father, but he was not the biological father. As you might imagine, there are a lot of what you would call altered family dynamics. I'll put it that way. Again, she's not going to make Mother of the Year, and as we'll find out, J.R. isn't exactly um, a candidate for Dad of the Year either. The, uh, on May 9th, they, they, they did this with the hearing, and J.R. was incarcerated in the Jackson County Adult Detention Center at the time. And he attended the hearing, but R.W. and B.W. did not. So they were personally notified, and as a result, they didn't show up to contest this, probably because they were doing drugs. They were strung out somewhere. Burns testified that the twins were born prematurely and tested positive for methamphetamines at, the, at birth. Mm. That's one of those things that is really frightening because prematurity alone is a pretty serious problem. Uh, generally, if you get somebody before their 28 weeks, they have all kinds of breathing problems. They may have eye problems. They may have uh, problems with bleeding in the brain because all of the blood vessels aren't necessarily formed yet. It can put the child at great risk, just prematurity. Now you add amphetamines on top of that and you have the recipe for a truly troubled child and a child who may have a number of developmental disabilities as he progresses. And I have to tell you, as somebody who had three children, and who has nine grandchildren, and who loves those guys all very much, I, I cannot imagine putting those children in danger. I couldn't imagine putting my children in danger. I also couldn't imagine putting the, the grandchildren in danger. And I wonder about what kind of support R.W. and B.W. must have had from their parents, because as I said before, this was her seventh and eighth child that she uh, was is giving birth to. So at this hearing, the person for uh, the state said that R.W. did not have custody of any of her eight children because of her substance abuse during pregnancy. In 2021, she gave birth to a girl who tested positive for amphetamines. In 2019, she gave birth to a boy who tested positive for amphetamines. Burns testified that four of the eight children had been adopted. Frazier added that R.W. and B.W.'s parental rights were involuntarily terminated for those four children in the previous three years. Frazier also agreed with CPS's plan to terminate parental rights and pursue adoption. That certainly seems to be a pretty good approach here. As for J.R., he was inc incarcerated for failing to register as a certain type of offender. And J.R. had two convictions previously, one for attempted assault of uh, a person that he shouldn't have assaulted because of age issues, and two, contributing to the delinquency of a minor. J.R. testified at the hearing that he was on probation for felony menacing when he was convicted. So, you know, again, not exactly father of the year material here. At the close of the hearing, the court found there was probable cause to believe the children would be endangered if returned to their custodial parents. Gee, you think? At the end of the day, that's what happened, and the Supreme Court of the state of Mississippi upheld that ruling. So we really don't need to go into very much more about the case at this point. What we do need to think about, and what 
I think we all ought to be thinking about is what happens to these children 10 and 15 and 20 years down the road. When these children are in their teen years and they're uncontrollable because they have brain injuries that were occasioned at birth, either because of prematurity or because of exposure to these toxic amphetamines at, a, at toxic levels in their system, are they ever going to be productive members of society? Well, I mean, it's possible. A lot of times children do actually recover and, and you know, go on and have a good life. But there are a lot of the crack babies from the 1980s and 1990s who are sleeping out in the sidewalks in some of our major cities these days because they absolutely can't get it together and can't function in society. One of the things that I think really needs to happen as a public policy issue, I think we need to do better about identifying people who are at risk with these kinds of drug abuse issues and forcing them into treatment. If these people commit crimes while they are on the these particular substances, particularly amphetamines and fentanyl and things like that, fentanyl will kill you. Amphetamines will make you crazy as a, a rat who houses himself in uh, the oldest type of toileting device known to man, okay? Be crazier than one of those. Um, so it, to me, is amazing that we don't have at state level or at a federal level, people who push for policies to help rehabilitate these people before we have this rash of births with children who are born with drug issues and with brain issues as a result of that. So one of the things that I am always asking people to do at the end of my videos on this channel is do a kindness for somebody. So today, I'm going to ask you to do a kindness for me in this way. Write to your state representative and your state senator and send the same letter to both and do it very simply. Children are being exposed in utero to dangerous chemicals and drugs. This limits their ability to become functional, productive citizens in our state. It increases the amount of money that our state must spend to house and train and feed these individuals and hopefully make them into productive citizens. All of this could be ameliorated very nicely if the state would allocate more funds and more effort at identifying people at risk for this kind of behavior. In other words, using some kind of toxic substance, whether it's tobacco, alcohol, uh, marijuana, methamphetamine, fentanyl, whatever it is, during the period of their pregnancy. There, there could be a massive effort to push pregnancy education at the school level to tell young women when they become pregnant what that issue is and what will happen to their child if they abuse substances while they are pregnant. That's what you could do. You could, you could ask people in government to fund these kinds of efforts. And I won't give you a, a suggested letter to send because I think it would come much more powerfully from your own pen. And that's essentially all I would like to see you do with this. This, this the whole purpose of this video is to raise awareness and to raise awareness at the level of the representatives. Because I can guarantee you, if you, as a productive, proud citizen of your state, are raising this issue with the people in government, they have not heard from you about something like this previously, and it might just have a big impact, and you might be able to, several years down the line, be responsible for saving someone's life, and wouldn't that be a good feeling? So that's what I have for you today. Thank you very much for watching. Sorry if it got a little preachy there at the end. I feel bad for that mother because she's lost her children forever. I feel bad for that father because if he ever gets out of jail and rehabilitates his life, he's already lost control of two of his heirs. And that should not be the case. You should never 
put yourself into that situation. And I honestly think that we've done a pretty poor job of helping people with those kinds of addictive personalities. I really wish there was a, a blood test or a, a written test like the MMPI that you could give to somebody and it would identify that they have abuse tendencies. But as far as I know, there is not. Anyway, that's neither here nor there. Leave a like and, and subscribe if you haven't. Of course, if you'd like to. I mean, you may not like to after this video. But again, thanks for being here. Come on back tomorrow. We'll talk about something that'll be a little bit more positive. Hey, as I said at the beginning, none of what I said is legal advice. But let me tell you what. The stuff that's going to be right up here, these are the things that YouTube thinks you might be interested in going forward. Have a terrific day.